Teddy Kennedy kills a woman at Chappaquiddick and then he spends the rest of his life looking into other people's past. Judith Warner of the New York Times, um, she called the Obamas demigods. You have Andrea Mitchell calling Barack Obama a rock star and many, many others. We can keep going. You mentioned <laughs> Joe, uh, Joe Klein of Time compared Obama to a, the political equivalent of a rainbow, which I'm sure was even a first for Obama <laughs> being compared to a rainbow. And by the way, I hate to interrupt you when you're on yeah. this stream. This goes all the way back to Andrew Jackson, the father of the Democratic Party. And according to his biographer, the crowds reacted to him as children greeting their father. What is it with these Democrats? Well, you're right. Can, Democrats are playing, <laughs> can you top this when it comes to idolizing their favorite politician? And it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing new. So, what, I mean, what drives their psychosis and looking at a man as and calling him a demigod? And by the way, I quote the great Jason Matera and his <laughs> fantastic book, Obama Zombies. And that scene, you quote, that some liberal posted it on his webpage in an Obama rally someplace, and one guy reaches out and touches Obama or shakes his hand or something. And then the whole line of them, hey, did you, did you touch, that, touch well, him? Let me and get then, some of that. Let me get some of that. And their hands all touch one another. It's like he's Jesus. You cannot imagine this happening at a conservative rally. Do you think that the same type of swooning we saw in 2008 uh, with the ham shakes and passing it down and calling Obama a rock star and I have sex dreams on Obama, all that, you think that happens 2012? It tends to fade over time, as as Marie Antoinette found out. <laughs> I don't know if it will switch from love to hate like it did for Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, um, another big part of my book on the French Revolution. But I, this is why conservatives don't have humans as gods. They're always going to disappoint you. We have a real savior. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Tons of fun facts in the book. I want to mention one because liberals, I'm sure, would uh, be, become apoplectic once reading it. And, and that is how uh, you write how Paul Krugman is out making hazy connections between all the time, between George Bush and, and uh, Enron. Krugman himself was actually a paid advisor for Enron while uh, writing these laudatory profiles on them. Yes, I love that. I believe, and if it's not in that chapter, it ought to be, that's on the chapter on liberals' contradictory thinking, how, you know, they'll viciously attack Clarence Thomas for dubious and obviously false, but let's just say allegations of engaging in verbal sexual harassment, and then they're hysterical about sexual McCarthyism for Bill Clinton. They, you know, Teddy Kennedy kills a woman at Chappaquiddick, and then he spends the rest of his life looking into other people's past. You have all these Democrats denouncing Tea Partiers for being racist for, I don't know, not supporting Obamacare, not having enough blacks at their rallies. They all send their kids to lily white private schools. I mean, the way they can maintain, the, for the civil discourse, um, <laughs> after the Arizona shooting, they start haranguing conservatives about civil discourse. Um, a, Keith Oberman was one of those people doing the haranguing. A Democratic congressman who just two months earlier had called for a Republican candidate for governor to be put up against the wall and shot, writes an op-ed piece in the New York Times calling for civil discourse. And most hilariously, the one man rolled out more than any other to talk about the importance of civil discourse so that you don't, you don't have mob uprisings, Al Sharpton. <laughs> yeah. A man who himself his own rhetoric has led to mob uprisings, violence, and, and yeah. seven deaths. That led to him getting stabbed, too. <laughs>